it's live. Live from New York. Get our mics working, everything's set. Okay, welcome everyone. We're gonna get underway with our photojournalism night. Let me get the lights down. Um, and we will bring up our Friday announcements. Uh, here we go. Okay. Good, okay. Again, welcome to Photojournalism Night. We'll start off with our uh, announcements, upcoming meetings. Um, next Friday, our rescheduled print nature competition uh, from the snowstorm will be next Friday night. The deadline for the prints then are the night of the um, competition. And since it is a print competition and the judges are judging here, we, for that half hour or 40 minutes to really uh, fill the time, we are lucky enough to have back again Eric Wethington from Dodd Company, who is going to be bringing this time, he talked about accessories last time, he's going to be bringing in cameras, bodies, lenses, oh my. Um, some of the old cameras you're going to see coming back too. But he'll have a lot of assortment of stuff from Dodd's. He'll have it up here. You'll be able to play with it, uh, ask questions. He's going to tell us about some of the new, new items, too. So that's next week, the pre-competition talk before the nature competition. Um, then we were lucky enough, uh, Kim Vajleski, our speaker coordinator, was lucky enough to strike a deal with Joe Edelman, a three-for-two sale we got. Um, no, it's two. We paid for two and got three. Got to be careful about that. I, we didn't pay for three and get two. That. We paid for two and got three lectures from Joe. Joe is incredible. If you've heard any of his lectures, Critique Suck or the DIY one he did last time, he is a real high-energy speaker. He knows his stuff. He is really fun to watch. He's going to be talking about the art of seeing, which if you go to our website on the calendar page and click, it has all about what that's going to be on. It's amazing because he's gonna talk about the brain science of how we, we think we got a good picture, but when we look at it, gee, we didn't notice this, that, how to really see things better. Um, he's gonna go through a lot of fun stuff. So that's a Zoom presentation, um, March 29th. The clubhouse will be open, so it'll be uh, live here. Uh, and also members will get a Zoom link. And then with all of our Zoom meetings too, I get asked this a lot. Our open meetings, like this competition, will be on our YouTube page, um, which is a public page. When we have our private um, Zoom conferences that we pay for, they don't usually like their material out on the public domain, so we put it on our website in the member content area. So if you miss it, you will, as a member, be able to get it through our website in the members uh, section. Um, April 5th, another Zoom presentation. I was out looking. I got him from Australia. He's going to be coming from Australia, which is 
middle of the night, I think, for them, or just waking up. But on Intro to Phone Photography, he runs a phone photography school. And so he's going to be, we're starting to get more into doing some stuff with phones. And so I got Greg to um, do a Zoom presentation for us on April 5th. On April 12th, a live presentation in the clubhouse, our own Barb Pennington, who is a published author on her latest book, Not So Ordinary Men, 50 Men Over 50, um, in the Cleveland area, who she did whole profiles uh, about, and how she went about it, got it published. Barb had also uh, just published the book uh, a year or two ago, The 50 Women Over 50, um, from uh, Northeast Ohio, which was fascinating. Um, again, so Barb is going to be here talking about her book on April 12th in the clubhouse. Our next SIG meeting, special interest group, the first Thursday of every month, uh, April 4th with Dave Bush. He's going to be talking on infrared photography. Um, everything to do with infrared filters that you put on your camera, post-processing apps to simulate infrared, modifying your camera, how to have an old camera modified so it only takes pictures in true infrared. So it should be really interesting. And then, of course, we break up into groups afterwards to talk about camera-specific issues uh, with Dave. That's April 4th. Upcoming field trip. Piston-powered Autorama, April 5th. I think it's the IX Center. Um, this is always a good one. Um, they have a lot of old classic cars there, a lot of material, and it is open to us before the public comes. Uh, so we're, we're able to stay once the public comes in, but we can come in before, before there are people there, take our time, tripods, anything you want to set up to. Um, so that's a lot of fun. There's more information on our website on the calendar page about that. That is April 5th. Positions still needed. Co-chairs of the competition committee. If you want to boss someone around, volunteer if you're good at bossing. Um, that, no, we need, we need someone to step up to this. So we are looking for co-chairs. We will show you everything you have to do. A lot of this stuff can be done you know, at home as well. Um, a lot of it is organizational. We need that. Um, anyone who has any instant in website management, some knowledge of websites that want to help out in updating our website in WordPress. And anyone who is interested, I need three phone photography instructors that I am looking for. So uh, again, those are things. And you could again just respond on our website. On our website, the information tab under there, there's a volunteer section, which has a form that you could fill out for further information. The Mentor Mentee Night is coming up April 2nd, where the mentors will be here. It's a Tuesday night, I think. The mentors will be here all to give a short presentation on their interests, their body of work. Um, mentees could come, hear all that. We'll be um, broadcasting that out as well. Um, there's more information that's going to be following on the uh, CPS website and by probably an email that you will get on that. And leading up to, you're getting sick of this slide, but I put it in now for the last six months, is the phone competition is coming up, our first ever phone competition. Um, again, send it three pictures, same thing, shutter score. I... The excuse, there is no excuse, I don't have a phone. You know, and if you have an old rotary phone, use that. I don't care. But basically, is snap some shots, get it in. The cameras are amazing. We're going to see what the interest is and, uh, and, you know, get to see. We'll have judges and everything. And, oh, and, by, and that's not part of the regular competition season. It, it will be a competition, though. And as always, this and all the, the public meetings we have are live on our YouTube channel which you get to by our home page of the website in the upper right column is a little youtube icon uh, you press that when you get to the youtube page click on live it's counterintuitive but live brings you to all of our uh, lectures in date order uh, otherwise it's really difficult to find and with that now we will get into uh, photojournalism with photojournalism again um, 
You can submit up to seven pictures. They should tell a story um, with this. If you are not able to be here, then we have you write out and we'll have someone read the comments on the picture tonight for the people that aren't here. If you are here, Brian will give you a microphone to then, so you're able to describe each of your uh, pictures as well. So let us get started. Bring up the images. Okay, Charles K. Is Charles here tonight? Okay. Here's Charles's image. Okay, Charles calls this rubber ducks in Akron. Family day in Akron, watching the Akron rubber ducks captured intensity of competitive action. And actually, since we just had the, the fundamentals, uh, I'm just going to jabber on a little on some of these because I think they're really interesting and cool, is the fact that you talk about action shots is look at it, he got the ball coming in, and that, that is moving fast, so I think this is a really nice shot. Christine is here, give her the mic. Okay. Okay. So I went to the Cleveland, right, I, mean, I had a customer teach me how to say this, Current Tovanye Festival. It's a Slavic Mardi Gras type festival that, um, Tries, they're celebrating the end of winter. One of the things that they have there are these mythical creatures called currents. That is one of their headdresses. They have ribbons all over the top and they always have a big red tongue. And if you look to the right there, they carry these wooden clubs. And throughout the festival, they collect handkerchiefs that girls and women give to them and they tie them onto their clubs. What do they do with the club again? They, they carry it. It's one of the things that when they're chasing the winter away, but they, uh, girls and women, culturally, it's a, they give colorful handkerchiefs to the currents, and then they tie the handkerchiefs to the clubs. So Cleveland started this festival in 2013. Uh, it was a way to celebrate Slavic culture and uh, keep alive a lot of the the information and, and pass it down to generations. One of the things that they do is have a lot of authentic costumes. They the last day of the festival is this parade, so these uh, these girls were all dressed in traditional costumes in the parade. And I loved this woman. She was having such a great time. She had this giant smile on her face. And again, authentic music, part of the parade. Is that considered an accordion or is that some other type of, or don't you know? I, it looks a little different than an accordion. Yeah, I'm not sure to be honest. Interesting. And here come the currents. So they are on their way to enter the parade. The, they wear these big sheepskin costumes with heavy boots, and they have special red and green leg warmers that go with them. And again, you can see the headdress on with the big red tongue, and there's their clubs, and they are getting ready to chase winter away. And they wear, around their waist is a chain with these big bells on them. And the bells are make a bunch of noise, and they're part of what they do to help get chase winter away and come in spring. And I love the little guy in the center there. He's a current in training. <laughs> and that's it. Doesn't have to go far. Great, Dave. Okay, I had a question. Okay, so I've never on, on the shutter score. It yes. said you could enter seven images. Yes. But it cut me off at five. Uh, did you have your name on it? Uh, were you signed in as yourself? Were you signed in under your name? I signed in on, on whatever. Shutter yeah, that's score. probably, I think you're on a list. 
somewhere. That's a, I'm on no, a list. No. <laughs> Is that good I, or bad, I mean, Richard? I, I mean, I don't, I mean, David, I'm sorry. I, I have no idea. It cut you off. At five. It says you couldn't answer. Maybe you didn't like the pictures. I don't know why, David. <laughs> It really, no, but it really, after five, you couldn't put on it. You mean you put on picture one, two, three, four, five, and then it said no more? I tried six and it wouldn't accept it. You got to take that up with uh, the computer. No, I will ask Randy on that, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. So did other people enter seven? Oh, wait, uh, yes. Yeah, I tried the one time to enter images, but it was close to nine o'clock, and I was oh. on. Ah. Yeah, this was, oh, the question is for the people at home is, yeah, it says on there deadline nine. I think it's an automatic thing, too, that Randy's not there, like, you know, get the fifth caller, you know, on the, the old thing, too. And he's not there. Slight, I think it might be an automatic computer thing. And if you're right up against the 9 p.m., that could be what, uh, what it is. So, that, yeah, were you? No, I wasn't. Yeah, this sounds like something I don't want to get involved in, so I will. Uh -huh. For those of you at home, the audience is kind of <laughs> sussing this out here. Uh, I'm, uh, are we ready? Dave, first of all, I am sorry. I will ask about it, and then we... Well, I was just curious. Wait, wait, we, ha we have, do we have a mic for Dave Tripp? Uh, okay, that, Dave Tripp. No, I was just curious. Yes, Dave Tripp will, he will take care of it, and he will get a... I don't know what to say. <laughs> okay, I, I thought I'd seen everything. Yeah. Okay, my uh, my pictures are about the uh, what are they about? <laughs> about the Day of the Dead, uh, Cleveland's Day of the Dead, nineteenth annual Day of the Dead, which was celebrated on November fourth uh, last year, and and the event was covered. Uh, by the plane dealer and by the Cleveland Stater and by the local Cleveland uh, TV stations. And, and they all included images. So uh, these, are, these are my images that help tell the story uh, of the Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead is a festival, a big holiday in uh, Mexico especially. And uh, it's become more and more popular here in the United States around the time of uh, Halloween. So in, in Mexico, it's celebrated on November 1st and 2nd. Uh, here, Cleveland does it on a weekend, so it was on November 4th. And it's uh, sponsored by Cleveland Public Theater. And uh, they're on, on the uh, near west side up in Cleveland on Detroit Avenue. Uh, they have a church building and, and a social hall that belong to the church. Uh, and, and they do uh, plays, theater, and uh, some, some of them are actually in, in Spanish. So uh, they're very involved with, with the Spanish community. Uh, and the uh, Spanish people up in, up in the Cleveland area especially. So uh, have you seen the movie Coco, this Disney movie, which really celebrates uh, the, uh, the Day of the Dead? And if you watch the movie, you learn, learn a lot about the, uh, the, the, the feast and the holiday. So this they, Dave, is this, are they celebrating, is it someone, I see a photograph there, is it someone in their, does it commemorate someone in their family? or the Could be a family. Uh, this girl's name was Maria, and uh, her mother had died that year. She had uh, six, six years fighting breast cancer, and uh, she died a few months before, before this young lady. She was a freshman at Hathaway Brown, uh, just a high school student. But she said she'd been coming to, to the Day of the Dead Festival in Cleveland her entire life. Uh, and, and she was very 
uh, proud of and active in her uh, Spanish heritage. Uh, and so when, when her mom died, she, she built this altar uh, in her memory. Now what they do in, in Mexico is they build them in their houses. Uh, and they have pictures of, of the deceased loved ones. They have uh, candles, skulls, flowers, marigolds especially. Uh, her mom liked music, so that's why she has records up there. Uh, her mom was very uh, supportive of, of other people. So she has uh, pictures of um, some kids from Hathaway Brown who had died uh, as part of her mom's uh, altar. But they built in in Mexico. They do this right, right in their homes. So, so I talk with her. I talk with her dad. I talk to to her grandma uh, for for a long time. And I was really, really impressed with this young lady. So you guys have all seen those Day of the Dead mass faces like she has becoming more and more and more popular every year here in the United States. Go ahead, Richard. So in addition to, to the altars in their homes, uh, on the Day of the Dead, November 1st and 2nd, uh, the Mexican people will actually go to the cemetery uh, and visit with the, with the deceased loved one, like, uh, in the movie Coco, keeping the memory of, of the loved one uh, keeps, keeps the loved one uh, alive at a certain level. And they, they actually talk about uh, the loved ones coming back and visiting on that day. Uh, but actually, they, vi they visit, uh, especially with their children. Uh, they bring food that the loved one uh, liked. They bring flowers, marigolds especially. They'll have a picnic right at the cemetery. Uh, and they'll, they'll tell stories to help, to help their children especially learn about and remember uh, deceased loved ones. So, so at the Day of the Dead in Cleveland, there, there's uh, a yard space between the social hall and the church. And, and there might be uh, a couple dozen of these, uh, these markers for, for the gravesite. And in Mexico, uh, if you've been there to a cemetery, they're actually, uh, the gravesite is, is like a little building. Uh, and they put maybe uh, some favorite things or, or things at least representing uh, the loved ones in, in the little building. Uh, the, the lady there, she's writing a remembrance to one of her loved ones and then they had a place to, to hang those up uh, on that structure, the other side of that structure she's sitting on. So it's an important part of the celebration in Mexico and uh, it's interesting to see these are, are, are created by uh, artists uh, and, and used for the celebration in Cleveland. Oh, there's Chris. Uh, so lots of people that, that come to the festival, and I've done this myself. We, we dress up. We, we get the, uh, the Day of the Dead painting on our face. Uh, and the people, the people spend so much time and effort uh, doing the costuming like this, the Day of the Dead costuming, uh, that they like, they like you to take their picture. Uh, and so it's a good opportunity to meet them, to talk with them, uh, talk, you know, with, with the people who come to the festival, same as us. This lady, uh, her daughter is a professional artist and, and she painted her face for her. She had 
uh, a gorgeous uh, monarch butterfly dress on. She had a big wreath that she, she held around, uh, around us and, and encouraged us to join her, to join her and get our pictures taken. Uh, but throughout the, the whole festival area, uh, people are, are in the Day of the Dead, traditional Day of the Dead costuming. So at the festival, uh, they have all kinds of Day of the Dead merchandise that, that you can buy. Uh, I think these, these are like ceramic skulls mostly uh, created by the vendor there. So they had maybe, what, 12 or so booths where, where they were selling all kinds of uh, mostly decorations. Uh, but they had food also. There were a couple food trucks there. Uh, and inside they were selling some, uh, some Mexican kind of bread that they use. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can buy your decorations and, and spend as little or a lot of money if, if you want. Neat, neat stuff, though. Go ahead, Richard. So, so one of the highlights of the day is, is a parade, which is at 3.30 uh, in the afternoon. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the people involved with their costuming and everything can actually uh, sign up and, and join the parade. Uh, and the streets, streets were crowded. Uh, it was a nice day. Uh, streets were crowded with people uh, watching the parade. Uh, and it's, it's just uh, a lot of fun. Uh, a van that goes down Detroit Avenue and, and then, then comes back. So, and the festival goes on at, at night. They have inter, uh, one of the slides that I tried to enter but didn't showed uh, musicians. Uh, so they have musicians uh, performing throughout the day, uh, singers, guitar players, uh, and then some, some bands playing uh, traditional kind of Mexican music. This is a, a beautiful picture. I was going to ask you on this, though. Were you... City. What makes this picture too is I love the angle of it. Looking up, you were you sitting well, down? You got to look up to that guy. Well, no, but I noticed the man in the pink on the left. You're below that level too. It looks like you're lower. Were you just standing there taking this picture? Basically, yeah. Oh, okay. Because it looked almost like you were down. Look, I know he's tall, but uh, it's a. Oh really yeah, I was really working hard. I got way down. I was lying on the ground <laughs> so, oh, and, okay. and pointing way. way. No, it's a, I just, it's a great shot. <laughs> I was just standing there. Okay, uh, Dave, is Dave here? I didn't see Dave. Okay. Okay, Dave says this is uh, Cavs fans in the streets. When the Cleveland Browns last brought a championship to town in 1964, me and most of my friends were not around or still in diapers. During the Cavaliers' exciting June 2016 playoff run, we gathered downtown to watch the big game seven. We witnessed an historic victory after the Cavs had been down in the series three games to one. After the win, we poured into the downtown streets to celebrate on a warm Sunday evening. You know, it's interesting. I'm sorry Dave isn't here. Because you know, I'd asked whether this was intentional or not the move. I think this was intentional to, to just show slow shutter speed. But it's almost like that's what makes the picture. If this had been a, you know, think of it in total sharpness or whatnot, it would have been just an average crowd scene. So this is, I think it's a really interesting, interesting shot. This is entitled Fan on a Post. People flowed through the streets and gathered in the East 4th Street area. Everyone was happy and high fives were all around. This fan found his way up on a post and took a seat up on the crosswalk sign to lead the, um, lead the crowd in cheers. And this is East Fourth Celebration. 
Normally, we would be a bit nervous about being out on the streets after 11 p.m. on a, quote, school night, but everyone was in great mood. Everyone was happy to see Cleveland's championship drought come to an end. I'm trying to decide what that thing is in the, that he's holding with the plants in. Is that something that was on the street, or is that? I don't know. Looks like a hanging planter. Yeah, it does, but in the middle of East 4th is, okay, well, just... Dave Ritus. Okay, this is dedicated fan. The crowd saying, we are the champions, and paraded around the downtown streets for hours. Cars clogged the streets with happy fans beeping their horns in celebration. And this is Jeff on East 4th. My cousin Jeff enjoys a cigar to celebrate the big win. And this is Brian on East 9th Street. After a few hours of dancing in the streets, we all returned to the real world. My friend Brian and I made our way up East 9th Street. I have Gary, Gary Marich. Not, right, so we're going to oh. uh, to read it. Did he yeah. put in any Chris? I, yeah, I've got it. I've got it. You got uh, it? Yeah, I've got something here. Um, this is Dade Massacre. This series of photographs is from a reenactment of the Dade's Dade Massacre, December 28, 1835, which started the Second Seminole War. There were three wars between the United States and Seminole. The USA armies lost all three. The reason for the wars is several chiefs did not want to be relocated to Oklahoma, which was Indian territory. The Seminole owned land, raised cattle, and planted and harvested crops in what is now Dade and Broward counties in Florida. The four companies of soldiers of the 4th Infantry, numbering eight officers and 102 non-commissioned officers and men, including several musicians and craftsmen, were en route from Fort Brooke on Tampa Bay to reinforce the garrison at Fort King in present-day Ocala, Florida. About 50 miles short of their destination, they were attacked by 180 Seminole warriors in a pine barren in present-day Bushnell, Florida. Okay, I'm going to massacre the name of this. He's got it, like, <laughs> spelled out for me. This is Chief... Micanopony, um, who fired the first shot that signaled the Seminole warriors to attack the army in battlements. Monuments. These are the monuments erected at the spot where Major Dade, Captain Frazier, and Lieutenant Mudge fell. Major Dade was killed by Chief Micanopony um, by his signal shot. Captain Frazier was killed and Lieutenant Mudge mortally wounded in the fighting that followed. This is Seminole Warriors. Seminole Indians used guerrilla tactics by hiding in the Pine Barren and attacking four companies of the 4th Infantry as they marched from Fort Brooke to Fort King, with a final skirmish and massacre happening near what is now Bushnell, Florida. This is artillery companies. Two of the four companies were artillery companies where the cannons were ineffective, shooting the cannonballs over the heads of the Seminoles. The first volley did scare the Seminoles off temporarily. And this is the massacre of the 4th Infantry. The Dade Massacre, 107 soldiers died, was one of the worst massacres of U.S. military by Indians, only surpassed by Custer's last stand 40 years later, where 253 soldiers died. You are thinking the Alamo, question mark? It does not count. Texas was not part of the USA, and it was the Texas Army that was massacred. Three soldiers survived the Dade Massacre. Starting to stand up is Private Edward de Courcy, who ran off with Private Ransom Clark. After splitting up, Private Edward de Courcy was hunted down and murdered the next day. 
Private Ransom Clark and Private Joseph Sprague made it back to Fort Brooke. This is original battlements. Here is the site of the original battlements. In February 1836, the soldiers were buried with honors. The officers were buried outside the battlement, and the enlisted men were buried inside the battlements in trenches. In August 1842, they were carried to the Garden of St. Saint Francis Barracks, now the St. Augustine National Cemetery. They were interred with 1,468 soldiers who died in the Seminole Wars in three vaults under three Kokina pyramids, known as Dade pyramids. During the battle, this area was a pine barren. The live oaks have grown there over the past 188 years. Very, very interesting. Joe. Joe. Give Joe a mic there. I had an opportunity to attend the Cleveland Tattoo Convention on February 23rd. Uh, it was going on the same weekend as the car show, so maybe some of you went to the car show. But if you missed the tattoo convention, it was just amazing. Um, the people are um, just so friendly and kind and extremely eccentric um, people. I took this photo because it just seemed like the appropriate thing to have that person facing away from me and um, to have the canvas in the photo and also to have the uh, photo that she was tattooing on this young man. And um, that's that one. Um, here you can see this gentleman tattooing that man's skull. And um, he's extremely focused. And uh, I, I was just amazed that that gentleman was willing to sit there and have the tattoo done on his skull as well as the snake that wraps around his eye. So um, it, it's just incredible, uh, just incredible to see these people, whether you're a, a tattoo person or not. Um, it's, it's really something to see. They probably had 100 artists, and I went the first night on Friday, and when I got there, probably 75 of the, of the 100 artists were tattooing. So there was lots, lots to see. And y you can see the artists themselves many times are just full of tattoos. And um, I asked every person if I could take their photo. And I also asked the canvas if it would be OK to take the photo. And with the exception of one person, all of the other people were very gracious and said, sure, take the picture. So this is, this is an incredible shot. I mean, this is just perfect. The expression on both of their faces, the color, everything. It's tremendous. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. No, I did not. I shot these with my Sony a7R5. And... Um, I had a 135 millimeter prime lens, and I had the ISO at 2500 the whole time I was shooting. So um, having the ISO that high really helped, and I was also trying to keep the shutter speed as low as I, as I could, but then of course you sacrifice that blurry image every now and then if the artist moves or something because usually they're just like frozen in time working in that one tiny little area. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it's, it's a very cool thing to see. Uh, this young lady I thought was just, she was amazing. I mean, just, you know, you look at her hair, you just look at her ear um, and the, the piercings and um, I don't know, it's just, just just an amazing thing, and again, she was, oh, sure, you can take my picture, and um, so, yeah, 
It, it was nice. I mean, that's a chain around her neck and nails in her ear. This is not a woman I'd mess with. <laughs> Uh, I took I took this uh, saved this photo I, and I edited this photo because uh, I thought the the man's image in the background did so much to tell the story of what was happening um, with this tattoo artist. Uh, the other thing I did with a lot of my photos, since that white light um, was so much a part of illuminating the tattoo area. Um, I took the temperature slider and I moved it over toward the, the cool area and it kind of gave a little bit of a blue cast to a lot of the photos and I really kind of like that. Um, but yeah, between the, 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 the canvas's leg and then the tattoo artist and then the photo behind him, I just thought it was kind of cool. And he also had a cool looking beard even though there's a little bit of blue in the gray because of the cast of the light. Uh, th this gentleman, again, very young guy, um, the tattoo artist, and you can see that um, he's, of course, filled with tattoos and extremely focused on tattooing this gentleman's stomach. And what I liked most was the guy was in a lot of pain, and so he had a, um, it was either like a towel or a sweatshirt or something he had over his face, and all I could see were his hands moving as uh, he was being tattooed. So uh, he was definitely having some discomfort. Um. Just amazing focus on these artists. You're yeah. right, they are like laser focused there. Yes, they are. Um, this, this image um, was kind of a, a little bit by accident. I didn't realize uh, what a nice photo it was until I started editing it later on. But I just like the way the light is casting over the side of that gentleman's face and over his shoulder. Um, and I don't know, to me it reminded me of like a, um, um, an ancient sculpture from the Greek somewhere where, you know, it's a, he's a stone sculpture and he's being tattooed by this uh, gentleman in the lower lower left. But um, again, just amazing stuff and um, a great place, great place to see these artists at work and their canvases. Uh, this guy was having a chest tattoo, and he never looked at the artist, and he never looked at me. When I asked if I could take his photo, he just kind of gave me a nod. But he has his um, ear pods in, and uh, he just kept looking off into the distance like he was totally bored with this whole process. Um, and I'm sure that chest tattoo was definitely had to be giving him some discomfort. Um, but I, I just liked his eyes, and um, I did what I could in my editing to um, try to have good focus on his eyes. That was an amazing set of pictures. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Did you get it? Yeah, question from the audience. Did you get a tattoo? I What an excuse. <laughs> that is, yeah. Tattoo, and I said, well, how much does that two, tattoo cost? And he says, well, this is the first night, so I'd do it for 800 But he said, if you come back tomorrow, it's Saturday, and that 800 becomes 1200 I was like, wow. Well, 800 or 1200 for a tattoo? But I guess you don't want to go to someone who's real cheap, though. I mean, uh, you know, when they're putting that stuff on your skin, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a place to scrimp. Uh, yeah, we got a question there. Yeah. Why did you think it should to go to this wait, wait, get, convention when you could have just gone to the Tattoo Expo? Because I think that's a lot of people would have gone to the Tattoo Expo. 
Oh, here, take the take the mic, Dave. So the people you at home can't hear me. No, the people at home can hear you. Oh, okay. So why do why do people choose to go to this convention instead of a regular tattoo parlor? Is it, is it cheaper at the convention or? Um, for one thing, many of these um, artists that are at the convention are renowned. So uh, I don't know if you know of a program called Ink Masters, um, but Ink Masters um, had I don't know how many seasons on television, and um, some of the Ink Master winners were actually here at the convention and um, tattooing people. So. You know, if you if you don't have a local artist that you work with all the time, and you go here, you have tons of choices, and um, I don't know, I, I don't know that much, but to me, it seemed like all the stuff that was being done was really good, really good. So my next question is. Uh, did you share these photographs with the artists and the people who are getting the tattoos? I did not share them because I really didn't know how. Um, this, this convention is sponsored by a company called Villains, and I guess these guys go all over the country um, and have conventions all over the country and, and earn probably some of their living that way. Um, but I would have been more than willing, and I would be more than willing, to try to find out who the contact person is and just send them the whole group because, yeah, those people were nice enough to say, go ahead and take my photo. So there might be a couple good ones in there that they might want to keep. Those images were amazing. Oh, awesome thank you. work. Thank you so much. Very nice. Okay, uh, John uh, Paganini. Okay, um, he calls this twist and shout. The Beatles Love Show at the Mirage in Las Vegas is a Cirque du Soleil de spectacle I have had the privilege of experiencing at least six times. With each visit, my appreciation deepens. These photos were taken with permission with an iPhone 15 Pro Max with the intent to capture just a small essence of this remarkable show that reflect the vibrant um, energy, intricate choreography, and timeless music of the Beatles. This photograph captures the spirit of an era-defining moment reminiscent of when the Beatles first graced the stage of the Ed Sullivan Show in New York back in 1964. It shows the electricity and excitement that swept over audiences as the Fab Four made their American debut. Like the original Volkswagen Beetle on stage, their arrival was a cultural touchstone, signifying an age of youthfulness, innovation, and a fresh wave of musical genius. He calls this Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. In this photo, we witness a scene that is a fantasy showing a balance and interconnection. Lucy is on a mechanical structure and is angled against a backdrop of radiant blue light that fans out into the darkness, suggesting an infinite space. The fireman is providing the counterbalance that keeps her stable. This act symbolizes a deep trust. The fireman is the anchor that allows Lucy to soar, which she does after this which she does after this onto a trapeze. Note the light and shadow, machinery, and human agility and their connection all coming together to capture the essence of the song's imaginative and surreal overtones. And while it is also denied by the Beatles, I believe the title Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds stands for LSD. <coughs> Here comes the sun. This photo depicts the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun, showing a psychedelic journey that bridges Western and Eastern cultures through a fusion of color, movement, and spirituality. The aerial artists are gracefully suspended against a backdrop of hazy, dreamlike smoke and reflect an uplifting message of renewal and hope. 
Below, a figure in a gold costume with headgear dominates the foreground, grounding the composition and guides the eye toward the aerialists who are on their spiritual voyage. This has come together. This monochrome photo captures the raw, rebellious spirit evoked by the Beatles song, Come Together. The performers reflect the counterculture fashion of the era, which is both defiance and unity. Their poses and expressions are intense while moving to the song in a rhythm. They are moving against the status quo. The spotlights create a sharp contrast of light and shadow, which highlighted the dancers. Each dancer, while dancing together as one, also seemed to be in their own world, showing their individuality. This scene reflected the culture and societal upheaval that was prevalent during the era. And this is something in the way they move. This photo captures a moment during the Beatles' classic hit, Something. It is a gravity-defying dance in aerobatics. In the center is a fragile young man, his back turned to us, reaching out to two women who appear to be effortlessly suspended in midair, floating in and out of his reach. Their outstretched hands nearly touch, suggesting a connection that is as haunting as it is elusive. The contrast between this grounded form and the aerial grace of the female figures embodies the song's essence while showing the complex nature of love. The powerful visual metaphor speaks to the universal human experience of reaching out for something just beyond our grasp. Excellent. Jordan, okay, Jordan, set there. Hello. Uh, so uh, this past summer, uh, the past couple of summers, I've been uh, going to some racetracks uh, with cars and motorcycles alike. Um, this was a photo of uh, my friend Connor. Um, it, it's not even one of my best photos. You can tell it's a little bit blurry. I didn't quite have the right angle that I wanted, but uh, the story I'm going to tell about Connor that, that day, uh, uh, he... This was the best photo I was able to get of him that day. I was still dialing in my settings, trying to find uh, the place uh, where I needed to stand to get the angle I wanted. But um, these uh, these races I've been going to, these uh, this is at a, a track out in Garrettsville, uh, the Nelson's Nelson's Legends eh, Nelson's Leches Road Course. Um, these motorcyclists hit this straightaway on that track and will do uh, upwards of 180 miles an hour. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult panning shot, um, but I do get a few <laughs> as I spray and pray as they fly by. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, uh, still dialing in my settings when he made his first uh, roughly two laps, two passes by me. Um, and we'll, uh, in the next pictures, we'll show why. Um, go ahead. By the way, panning at 180 miles an hour is Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, not, I mean, yes, you I'm just cross impressed. your fingers and hope yeah. that you get a sharp image a lot of times. Uh, so this is Connor uh, in the paddock um, working on his bike, getting it prepped earlier that morning. Um, Going to these events is really cool because uh, most of the events, they'll let you just kind of walk around the paddock or the pit where all the bikes are parked. Um, and all the racers are right there. You can walk right up to them, ask them questions, look, get real close and look at all the bikes. Um, they, uh, they line them up right just to the left of this picture is where the starting line is of the track and they put these uh, heating pads on their tires to keep them warm overnight. A lot of these guys are from out of state or even out of the country and they travel here. They park their bikes overnight and sleep in their trailer or, or their trucks or whatever they bring. Um, so they put these heating pads to keep the rubber uh, from cooling down so the, the tires stay sticky so they have lots of grip. Um, so yeah, that's just him getting his, his bike ready for the day. 
uh, another shot, uh, more close up to get some of the details of the bike. Um, uh, the the bike here uh, was a Yamaha R6, uh, which Connor had told me the story earlier. Um, about two years ago, he had an accident where he wrecked his bike in New Jersey, the same exact bike, and he rebuilt it himself, uh, tore it down to the frame, and pretty much replaced every piece on it. Uh, he works on it himself, and and every piece was put on by him. So this is why I wasn't able to get any more pictures of Connor that day, because uh, on the, I believe it's the seventh turn, uh, coming out of the carousel, uh, he hit a slick spot on the track, uh, doing roughly 120 miles an hour. And that is his bike upside down in the grass, about 30 feet off of the track. Uh, you can see the gentleman on the left holding one of the body pieces of his motorcycle. Um, luckily, he was OK. And we'll, uh, we'll get to that, uh, minor injuries. Uh, he was going so fast uh, when the bike slid off the pavement and hit the grass, it, it flipped in the air a couple times and threw the uh, battery of the motorcycle out into that field. Uh, we never found it. Um, and, uh, you know, most of these guys that are working the track are, you know, they're also, um, they're also motorcycle riders, and um, this gentleman on the left, uh, who I saw ride his motorcycle into the track that morning, uh, just kept mumbling to himself, uh, <laughs> I can't believe these idiots do this <laughs> expletive. Uh, so yeah, so this is a close-up of the motorcycle afterwards uh, with Connor in the background, safe and sound. Uh, his uh, quote was, I think I can fix it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I tried to get, uh, I tried to get a, a little bit more of the front of the bike, but I, I was uh, right on the kind of the edge of the road there. I didn't want to get in any, anybody else's way. Um, his only injury that day was... Uh, uh, sprained thumb <laughs> after sliding out at 120 miles an hour. <laughs> so very lucky. Um, and uh, uh, he has this bike fixed, but uh, I think he races another bike now. Um, I'll be meeting him this summer to to uh, uh, capture some more races. Um, he just said that uh, I'm not allowed to talk to him until after his first race for luck purposes. So that was just a picture of the front of his bike, what it looked like before. Uh, I meant to upload these in a little bit different order, but just to kind of show some of the details, um, some of the different race associations you can see on there that he races for, AMA, CCS. Um, this event was put on by uh, a race association called WERA, that's W-E-R-A. Um, that acronym eludes me right now, something something race association. But just to get some more details of the bike that uh, was destroyed that day. And then this was uh, the crew after they pulled it out of the grass. He got to take some pieces of grass home as a memento. Um, that was just after they loaded it onto the trailer. Thank you. That's absolutely, yeah, I, even with its soft grass and everything, I find it absolutely fascinating, because even if you would just roll, the amount of rolls you would take or something at that speed, yeah. th that he looks so good is absolutely unbelievable. It's real scary because I was on the other side of the track, yeah. and so all I know is... I oh, you didn't know at the time. All I know is I saw him go around once, Yes. And, I, I didn't and you didn't see him come back, oh my gosh. That is amazing. Dave, you want to give a, Brian, you want to give a mic? There we go. Oh, you want to give it to, D Dave's got a, oh, you have a question, Maria? No. Oh, Dave's got a question in back. Oh, sorry. Okay, the pictures are amazing, and the story was amazing. Uh, 
What kind of settings do you use when you try to catch them going 180 miles an hour? So uh, usually anywhere between a 60th and a second and like a 20th. Um, I'm not using a full frame camera, so I have to, uh, you know, try to balance out uh, the shutter speed to uh, the amount of light I can let in with uh, the smaller sensor. Um, but I shoot, it's a Fuji, uh, and it has a 1.4 crop on it because of the sensor size. So uh, at the time I had a 50 to 230 lens, which is basically like a 100 to 400. Um, and I'm usually zoomed all the way in because uh, the track officials, uh, they don't want you to get too close, um, obvious, for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm usually around a hundredth of a second and it's, uh, you know, burst mode I usually get three to five bursts with my camera and and if I'm lucky I get one in focus and so you're with panning you're panning and with burst yes uh -huh. um, are you hand are you handheld or on a tripod um, depending on where I'm at I'll do handheld and then if I'm in an easy to shoot spot I'll use a monopod because it lets you kind of move a little bit more freely Amazing. Oh, we got another question over here. Do they publish a race wait, 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 wait till the, so the people do they, at home. Do they publish a race schedule like online where you can go and see what races are coming and where they located? And how do we find that? Hello? Yeah, so um, the racetrack, uh, Nelson's Ledges Road Course, will publish a schedule. Also, the race association, WIRA, will also uh, publish uh, their schedule. Now, it's like 20 bucks to get in, um, and they do have a, uh, you know, um, hired photographer. Um, he was actually in one of the pictures helping pick up the bike. Um, uh, but he was nice enough... I, what I found with the racing is if there is already a hired photographer there, I usually just go and try to rub shoulders with them and be like, hey, do you care if I shadow you? Do you care if I take some pictures? You know, what are the good corners to go to? What's safe? What's not? Who do I need to talk to? Those types of questions. And you, most of the time, they're pretty okay with that. Um, and I always try to make sure I mention like, hey, you know, I'm not making any money off of this. I'm just a guy that's, you know, trying to not get in your way. Um, so just be aware of that. Some, sometimes the hired photographers will get a little, they'll, they'll have an issue if you're taking pictures because you're kind of stepping on their, their livelihood a little bit. So just be aware of that. But um, otherwise, if you go and you talk to them and you just say like, hey, I'm just a hobbyist. I'm just, you know, trying to be safe. Usually they're pretty cool about it. So like Nelson's Ledges Road Course, and you'd find the schedule. Thank you. Okay, great. Phenomenal. Okay, Mariah. These were amazing stories. I mean, the whole having seven pictures like, gives us a whole range of, um, pardon? Or five. Yeah, or five. Give us a whole range, and some of them are really photogenic in there. It's amazing. So thank you for all that. Okay, mine's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's not a story. Um, <clears throat> this is a printmaker down at the Zygote Press, where I go frequently. Um, he has just run one of his prints through this big French press. And he is looking at the results on the other side. At Zygote, they have five presses. So you've got individual artists who go down there and create their monotypes, their etchings, their woodcuts, because they've got these presses here. So I took a picture of him the other day as he was looking at the results of one of his pressed images. 
Then I went looking for people. I got in my car, and I just went looking for uh, photojournalism kinds of pictures, people in Cleveland, or people on the street, or people doing what people do. And it's amazing how few people there are in a big city. I know there's hardly anybody outside in the, sub <coughs> in the suburbs, but you'd think there would be a lot of people in the city. And this was just a group of people hanging out beside the fire hydrant there, um, and going by, I took the picture. That is it. Were you walking by, or is this from your car? No, I didn't walk by. So I was in the car. In the car, the car stopped, and and I yes, I had the yeah. car stopped uh, across the street. Pardon? So you, oh, were you driving? I was. So you you'd park the car like, and then just lean out the window it, and get exactly, the shot. Exactly right. So I did that a lot. I do that a lot anyway, just to get around to see what's going on. Um, and I thought this was kind of a, a neat cluster. Who knows what they were talking about? Talking about that lady parked across the street. <laughs> <Interesting>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I was downtown um, and did come across Tent City. I don't know that anybody has been downtown and knows where the homeless people in Cleveland where is Tent Are City? camped. It's um, near Rockwell. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the street, but it's almost, you know, downtown. And if you, I think the next picture will show you the next one, and maybe the name of the street is on it. There we go. It's at Payne and East 19th. Um, and there is a cluster of tents, and as I went by, I could see that people were inside the tents. And I just wondered how and why they're all clustered on that corner, and whether the city controls it, or, you know, you can only be in these places. I know I have met people who live under the bridges, but I just happened to be driving around and, and came across this, so I went around the block a few times. So it's at East 19th and Payne. That's I, interesting. I didn't know this was there, you know, because it's, it's so obvious out there as to whether it's city-sponsored or encouraged or I, I'm, I don't know if anyone knows. Yeah, right. It's very interesting. Yeah, so you wonder what that's like in the winter um, and whether people cluster together because they can be there on that corner or whether they like to be together, you know. Um, and here's another uh, picture I just took as people waited for the bus. Um, everybody, of course, is on their telephone. It's hard to get somebody who isn't, no matter where you are. But I, I kind of like the framing. They're waiting for the bus, and here are these little scooters in the front. Yeah, those scooters still legal. There was a time they weren't in Cleveland, the, the bird and the lime scooters. Um, those are the ones you, you rent. Right. Um, they're wild. We had some accidents and they were illegal, but now they must. I just don't see many downtown. Well, there are quite a few. Are and there? they're in the suburbs as well, yeah. Really? Yep. And you've got to watch out for them because they once they're coming down the street, they can use both sides of the street, they feel, as you're coming at them. Hey, thank you, Maria. I now I, I hate going towards the end too. I, I mean, no one in here is getting stuck. Everyone's standing still. They're not doing 120 miles an hour, and they're not dead. Uh -huh. From the other, so basically, is yeah, I, it's kind of a, a downer. At the other, they're really excellent pictures. This is when um, I got off uh, Jordan, and we'll go. Uh, just these are some of the ones I just processed. Um, when I was in India about six months ago. And this part of India in Rajasthan is over by the, um, um, by the border. When they said by the border, I thought, you know, 100 miles or so away, because they're talking about the Pakistani border. And, you know, I, I can't read Hindi, um, 
two, it is we're driving in the car because the guy says this is a really cool city we're going to and whatnot. And you have these big road signs above the highway that's all in Hindi, except for the, you know, the, the number and the KMs. And it's going from, you know, 30 KMs to 20, you know, you're down to like five KMs, which I know is probably like about three, you know, and that's to the border too. So this is up by the Pakistani border. And I said, well, basically, is this like, you know, one of those giant ones, you know, where you don't have to worry about everyone coming across and whatnot. Said, no, said, there's no real border. You know, it's just, we know where it is. You know, it's very encouraging. So um, we got some shots from out there. And this is a little bit different than most other parts of India. Um, in the, or towards, the, uh, towards Pakistan too, you get more of the Muslim population. India, India is predominantly Hindu uh, with a Muslim minority. But out towards Pakistan, it is, you'll see more, uh, more Muslim. And even in the, the really, really hot, these are workers out in the street, literally chopping up stones and things with hand tools. Most everything done in India. India is now the largest country in the world, surpassed China. It is, I think, 1.4 billion uh, people. And a tremendous amount of the things there are done by hand. Uh, rather than mechanized. And so you'll see street scenes out this. And again, uh, drinking water, but uh, the women, again, heads covered uh, for religious reasons, um, too, out working in the street. So I thought this was just an interesting, um, interesting street scene. You see a lot, of, uh, a lot of kids on the street, and a lot of colorful colors, too. A lot of reds and oranges, things of that sort. And these aren't homeless people. Um, there are so many people in India hanging around on the street, kids selling things on the street. Um, it, that's just the way it is. And the dress is different. It's not because people are poor. That's the way people, a lot of them just, just dress there as well. So this isn't a homeless kid sitting around. This is just what normal kids do out there. He's just kind of hanging around, dressed like uh, all the other kids too. And he was just a, a, a great, looking, uh, great looking kid. So I, I got off a shot with my uh, 70 to 200 uh, lens. Except it didn't have to be stealthy here because he obviously saw me and liked it. And I just liked this uh, expression. Sometimes it works when they're actually, you know, if you can get them candid or look at, that's fine too. But sometimes it's even better when they look at it really just like a, pleasant, engaging look as well. You can see some of the Indian art in the background. Um, again, a lot of the things, especially out farther in India towards the borders there as well, you'll see sidewalks, streets and things too. A lot of them are not in the best repair and that's just the way it is. But what's interesting is you travel there, if you're, you know, when you're there long enough, this doesn't look unusual. This is just, just the way it is, the way everything is. This is normal. Um, after a while. Again, the cutest kids around, um, this little girl here outside of a, of a shop, um, just there, foot on a rock. Uh, again, mostly rock sidewalks there as well. You could see a lot of the stalls and things are more just handmade. And um, again, just Typical dress in that part of India, and uh, again, very just nice little little street scene. Again, she knows I'm there, but didn't really didn't really care, and uh, I just like the expression. Uh, I usually take several shots. Sometimes, you know, the first one you could get when they don't notice you're there and they're looking away. Uh, then you get some where they're looking at you, whatnot, and you go through them. And sometimes, again, when they're actually, her eyes are a little averted toward me. I just like that look of the, the scene. So there's no set rule. You just take, you know, take a bunch and decide which one you, you like. Again, darling little kid, dressed there, um, and I just love his just big eyes, and again, looking at me, he knows I'm there. Uh, and again, as we, we teach in the fundamentals class as well, even when you're out there, what could make a picture too, a simple thing is, even though I'm standing there fine, got to get down on it, get below their level. Almost all the pictures we take of kids are from our level, and you're looking down, and it's really kind of uninteresting. Here, 
you're on your knee, so you're looking up a little at them or, you know, on their same level, and it just helps. But uh, again, just a, a lot of, a lot of uh, interesting people at that part. And my favorite, one of, our, one of the priests there as well, I have a lot of him. We were in a side alley. Um, it was uh, late afternoon, so the golden hour. Then he is also dressed in orange, and the walls were a little orange too, which gives the orange kind of glow, a little backlit with the sun being up there. But this was another interesting one where not only did I think he was a tremendous character, but, um, I mean, character not in the adverse sense, just had character in him. Um, but again, what I enjoy when you're out is people think, because they ask me, that you just see this interesting person, you go up, you frame your picture, and this is the picture. I t like the whale watch. Wow, you took that one picture and got the whale fluke up. No, you don't see the other 999. At this, there are a lot. There are a lot of them from a distance, you know, the 200 millimeter, candid, all over the thing too. But the one, and why I picked actually some of these is because these are ones that, the one I happen to like the most, when he was actually saw me there and raised his hand almost like in a, in a greeting thing too. And I just like, but not really smiling in the obvious kind of tourist look. And I just like this one. So with candidates, there's no rule. You just, you, you know, you just find, you just like which, whichever one just appeals to you. Uh, but again, I just uh, really, really enjoyed uh, this one, especially with that little bit of rim lighting. And, and people are, we get back to street photography again, is people are really friendly. I, most of the time, I mean, are you gonna get an adverse incident? Yeah, I mean, everyone does. But 95% of the time, if you're friendly, people don't mind at all, and, uh, and they're very nice, nice about it. So it's not that big, if you're thinking about doing street photography, it's not that big of a problem with just a little common sense. This was, a, we're right up against the Pakistani border now, and uh, as we were driving, uh, one of the things we didn't expect, there was a little Bedouin uh, village um, off to the side, just a collection of little huts, and there were a few tents there, um, where the camel herders, because this actually, towards the Pakistani border, even though it's India, this becomes desert out here. So there's a lot of camels, camel herders, things of that sort, and uh, again, this is a much poorer area out here. And this was just one of the uh, little boys there. Um, a lot of just garbage strewn around. Um, they are very, I just like this, this pose. I have a lot of him. You can see the dirty feet there, the garbage all around. Um, and it's interesting because I must have about gee, 30, 40 of him. Uh, but it's just this one, you pick out that pose, that one, you know, the one that you like. There's a lot of character in, and it changes with each time, whether they're looking at you, they're happy, they're sad, they're pensive, they're looking off. So with street photography, well, it's, it's fun just to kind of look through these, and it's not that you have, you're, you're thinking on your feet, it's not that you have a particular, oh, I'll get this shot too. And of all the, you know, as I put the 30 of him up there, there was just one of, just the way he was looking, looking down like that, that I really just, uh, just kind of summarized the whole condition out here. And by the way, these kids are very happy. They're having the greatest time ever, playing with just stuff around, chasing each other, whatnot, uh, too. And, and they are happy, normal kids. And this is my final one. This was the, the golden hour as the sun was setting, long shadows. And as we got there over the ridge, um, just I was on this side of this ridge of this big uh, sand dune, and a guy was walking this, his camel home, and he was being followed there. And just the colorful, the red, the long shadows, the, the, just the sunset hour, uh, the desert of it too. I really just, uh, just like this one too. And it shows you can crop these. What makes this, this really didn't look as impressive in a, just a regular eight by 10 crop, the usual crops we do. And now with our competitions and things too, you don't have to have it any size. You, know, you could crop it any way you want. And so I think it's nice just to experiment. I just cropped it long and thin here too. And it gave it that panorama look. So, and this was, 
and over the other side, which I did not, I did not cross that line because somewhere they told me is Pakistan, and I didn't want to accidentally step that line, so I stayed here. You know, actually, we actually asked them. We said, well, actually, show, could you show me where the border is? And they was like, well, it's kind of around there or something, too. So, yeah, yeah, I don't want to mess with it. You know, if it was Canada, I'd, I'd go look and take a few shots and things, too, but it's a bit different. So those are my uh, shots from that part of Rajasthan. So, okay. Yes, we have a question there. We're going to give a mic to... Thanks. Um, uh, two questions, I think. One, uh, when you go to these places, I saw some of your pictures from Jordan, and I think you also had shown some pictures from Africa at some point. Um, are you going by yourself with a group? Are you like hiring a tour guide, or are you just kind of doing the research and, and picking the places out and just going yourself? Oh, we've do, uh, done a number of ways. Actually, we, um, when you get married, you learn a lot of things. Um, <laughs> one of them is, is that my wife has zero interest in photography, yeah. Yeah, but she likes to travel. I love photography. I hate churches and those kind of things too. So basically is what's allowed us over the years is we go and we'll go kind of on these smaller tours and we'll go like to Egypt and she's hangs around with the, the rest of the people in the group, you know, we go to the little, and I'm always lagging behind or out around exploring and having to be found and that type of thing. And you're right, it is a trade-off because it's not optimal. Some shots I use in training, we went to the pyramids at uh, 11.30 in the morning because that's when the tour takes you. And that's the worst time. I mean, there's no shadows, all the shots look like crap because they're just, yeah, yeah, it's the pyramids, but there's, there's just, everything is flat as anything too. And, but that's just the way it is. So with a lot of these, it, it is a trade-off. So it is these tours, or sometimes we'll, with a few other people, we'll hire someone. We went to Bhutan and take us around. But same thing, most are not uh, photographers. If you go on a photography tour, they always wake up, they get to places when the light's right and all those kind of things and you're doing it. But so we just go, the you answer to your question is we just go on regular just tours that, that everyone goes on and I'm usually just lagging behind or grabbing the best I can. Cool. Yeah, you kind of answered my second question, but more specifically the second question is when you plan to go to these places, do you have certain photos in mind that you want to try to get or do you ever um, like say like, oh, it'd be really cool to get like this type of shot or that type of shot? Well, that's a very, very interesting question. And I do, um, when I do, I do a talk on travel photography and that's one of the, my parts of there is the research. Is I very heavily, like when we went to Morocco, I know the itinerary, I will go online, I'll go to all these different photo sites and look up like in the fest, in the bazaar there. I will look up every shot I can get of that. Um, and so the, by, by the time when I go there, I know that, okay, this is what I'm likely to see. This is what the markets look like. Here's what lens I could use for that. And I have a good idea. And it, that's part of the fun of planning for these. Um, and I do that same thing in the States. If I was going to you know, Yellowstone. I would pick up, you know, every picture I could find and look and whatnot and think out in my mind, okay, this is an average shot, but if I went over there and things too. So when I get there, yes, all these things are new, but I have an idea of what each of these stops are going to be and what I'm going to try to do um, as well. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Okay. Go on. And we've got... Wally. Let me say ahead of time, Wally is, if you, if, he is a member of the club. He is a phenomenal, just store, backstory too. Um, but he presented the last photojournalism night and it was really, really something. So, uh, ready, Chris, we'll do some of his shots tonight. <laughs> okay, this is in the... Uh, Egyptian Wissen Desert. Uh, Wally, I didn't. Rec I'm sorry. Wally's right in front of me. I didn't recognize <laughs> Wally right here. So uh, I apologize, everyone. Oh, We've actually great. got Wally. Wally, can you just 
because I thought your shots were so phenomenal last time, could you give a little, the, the history again, like you did last time, about what you've done before? Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, my family and I lived in, the, in Egypt for six years, and I shot for various, various agencies there. I also did a lot of work for non-profits and so on, and uh, it's, a, it's a real paradise, if you like, documentary work, so it was fun. <laughs> okay, so this is in the Egyptian desert, uh, and the at night the Bedouins uh, made some m music on some drums and so on, and everybody, everybody was just dancing around the fire. Next one. The, 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 the motion blur on this is what, you know, again, Whoops! That's what that's what makes this. This is a beautiful technique. Well, it was it was really dark. Uh, I slid a a one DS Mark II, so really slow. You know, if you go above above sixteen hundred ISO, it's kind of you've you've killed it. So I I put my camera down on top of my camera bag, and I just like press the shutter like one second, another one, one second. I shot maybe about. 30 or 40 pictures, and then there were like two or three of those that uh, worked out. <laughs> yeah, this is also in the Western Desert. Uh, it's pretty amazing. This guy's name is Abdallah, and he's a sheikh, and he makes us food on the fire. In the morning, you wake up, and it's still dark, and he's making bread on the fire like that. Pretty cool. And this is at a camel market outside Cairo. Uh, the guy was just enjoying his tea. Uh, this was in uh, Darfur in Sudan. Uh, I was sent there to uh, capture some of the images of the uh, of the genocide that was happening in Darfur, and these ladies were at one of the um, one of the clinics. This is one of the most beautiful shots I've seen. That not only the, the expression and character on her face, but the colors of her and the people in the background matching the the bricks on the wall. It's just the color palette is, and the darkened skin is is just beautiful. Well, I. Uh, there were a number of them that were dressed differently, so I moved around until I could find the background that I liked with this. Okay, so now we're in Yemen, uh, and I had to go shoot something there for, uh, for the UN, and down in Arden, you know, on the coast, I drove up the street and just in the, in the middle of the street, there were these boys playing pool. And uh, so I, I jumped out and took a picture. That's not something you see in downtown no. Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pool party. <laughs> this is also in Yemen, uh, in Aden, and my, uh, uh, I had to shoot for UN AIDS. So uh, what we did is we tried to capture uh, pictures of people that would be um, that would be vu vu vulnerable to uh, to HIV and AIDS, and part of those are f fishermen. So I went out on a a fishing boat for a day with these guys. And this is an amazing story. I was in Darfur and. When the agency sent me, they, uh, they gave me a phone number and said that if I called that number, uh, I might be able to meet the leader of the rebels in, uh, in Darfur. And obviously the, uh, the Sudanese government would like to know that too, so it was kind of hush-hush. And I tried to call that number every day and it just never worked out. And so I spoke to uh, one of the guys at the UN, uh, a local, and 
told him the story, and he said, just pass me the number. And the next day he comes to me and he says, okay, I found someone that can talk to you. Uh, if, if you can find your driver, we can go to him now. So we drive about a mile or two, and it's still in the town, and we, uh, uh, we meet this guy, and we start talking, and I'm taking pictures, and I notice that everybody around him is very, like, they bow, and they very respectful. And so I asked him, you know, why are they doing that? And he says, uh, if, if they were still having a king, he would be the king. So I, I met the actual Mahdi or the uh, king of Darfur. And so we just, I just sat there for like two, three hours and we just talked. And I, I did a few portraits of him, but I mean, it was just an amazing experience to talk with this man. That is, that is amazing. It is. <laughs> you know, you get your, your, uh, <clears throat> your days uh, that you're in the Middle East and you're thinking, well, I'm going to make a difference. And then you, now again, you just find that, that thing that just makes your day and just, it's like a milestone. That is, those are uh, amazing. And we are going to be seeing more, more of Wally because he's probably going to be doing some lectures in the future and whatnot as well. His shots are incredible. I advise you to visit his uh, website. So um, thank you. Well, thank, you every, thank you, everyone. That is, our, our, that is it for tonight. Um, and thank you all who submitted pictures. Thank you, all the people at home. Um, and yes, have a good evening. some of these